Tell me about how you wound up in Uganda. After I got my uh, master's in in uh, public health, I became the oncologist at at uh, UCSF in the university hospital um, for the AIDS clinic. So all the patients. This is Moffitt. This is Moffitt. Yep. So the, San Francisco General had a very well known program run by oncologists for AIDS patients who were in the safety net hospital, um, but in the university hospital. If you were very sick and you had Kaposi's sarcoma, you saw me. Mm -hmm. um, and my husband, because we had just gotten married, um, who was an, uh, we were interns together, he was in the lab in ID doing uh, immunology work. Mm. So um, the uh, two of the chiefs of medicine at UCSF were approached by the Rockefeller Foundation, who had started to become worried about heterosexual transmission of HIV. Remember I talked about the Haitians and the, the hemophiliacs and homosexuals? 1H wasn't heterosexual. And so there was a lot of disbelief about African HIV. And in fact, some people thought it must be um, uh, gay sex, but people are too embarrassed to admit it. Mm -hmm. um, there were other theories, but um, people just did not understand what was going on in Africa. And so the Rockefeller said, we'll give you a grant at UCSF. We'll uh, grant you money to study heterosexual transmission of HIV. And this was through an epidemiologic contact tracing lens, not necessarily going into the lab and trying to figure this out. Not going to the lab, but really looking at epi. And, and particularly, there was a hypothesis that if it was heterosexually transmitted, there was something to do with sexually transmitted diseases. Mm -hmm. um, and that there was something about increasing your risk if you had untreated STDs, sexually yeah. transmitted diseases. Give me a sense of what this meant. So we're talking late 80s now. We're, this is 89, 90, and 91. So we're, we're, remind me, is AZT out yet? Not yet. Okay. Just on the brink. Okay. So we yeah. have nothing. And what is the approximate uh, conversion? So for a patient who develops AIDS, what fraction of those will go on to develop KS. If you were in Uganda at the time, um, gosh, especially amongst males, but also males and females, it's so hard to give those numbers. But I would say about a third of the one, uh, patients who who sought medical attention probably had KS, some KS. And what was the prevalence of HIV/AIDS in the population in Uganda? Depend on the population you treated. Um, it was double digits in the country as a whole. Wow. If you were 16 years old, if you were a 16-year-old girl and you went to the STD clinic, you had a 50% chance of being HIV positive. 16. And most of those girls was their first and only sexual partner. So what that and, meant and is it was Russian roulette to have sex in Uganda then. I mean, worse than Russian roulette, that's one in six if yeah. you've only got one bullet in the chamber. This is You got is the bullet in brutal. one of the two chambers. Yeah, yeah. And the best business in town, coffin maker. Like we would go, we would drive back to where we stayed and you would see if you've ever been in an African village, like they'll prop up the coffins yes. made of wood and you just see them because that was, that was what was done. It was... You know, the feeling of being scared and sad in San Francisco in 1982, multiply that by a thousand in 1989. It was terrifying. If we hadn't gotten ARVs, this was killing people. But, you know, the same time, the first time we went back to um, San Francisco from Uganda was six months after we had left. I went back to the Kaposi Sarcoma Clinic that, that I had... Um, uh, led and said to the nurse, oh, you know, you ask about your patients. Uh, I had so many great um, guys who I cared for. All my patients were dead. All of them. Six months. So the, the sense of how bad HIV was before antiretrovirals, it's impossible to overstate it. Just impossible. Um, and when we were in Uganda, there was, it was really clear that you could see someone's immune status with a good physical exam if they had Kaposi sarcoma. I wrote a paper that I think is a, is a good paper if you do global health and you have limited resources. It was a paper that had one observation. If you had Kaposi sarcoma on your soft palate, in, on the roof of your mouth, you had HIV, 100% predictive. 
it it doesn't Kaposi sarcoma. There's a Mediterranean form and an African form. It happens on your skin. It can cause elephantiasis, but it doesn't go in. And you know the mouth is just a, a surrogate for your GI tract. Doesn't happen unless you're immunosuppressed. With and uh, to be HIV. clear, these patients weren't necessarily dying from the KS directly. It was that's a that's a proxy for how weak their immune system was. I assume they were ultimately dying from a pneumonia. Many would die from pneumonia. There, there was was severe cachexia, and then mm. they were prone to uh, pneumonia and other problems. But Kaposi sarcoma in the lungs or the stomach can also cause um, bleeding, bleeding yeah. and you can die from that. And again, what did you know at this point in time about HIV? Because the virus had been identified mm -hmm. by this point. Um, what was what was known and what was unknown? So we knew um, we knew most of the clinical syndromes associated with HIV. This was what, Gallo. Was it Gallo who? Um, uh, yeah, Bob Gallo was one of the. One Luke of the, one of the was. Yep. Yep. Okay. You know, they had a fight over who. Who who, who deserved <laughs> who the credit deserved for the that? Credit. Yep. Um, but yeah, we knew about HIV then, um, and and we knew the biology, and we knew as soon as we got to Uganda and examined patients that this was heterosexual transmission of HIV. Um, and we knew that untreated uh, STDs were a big reason. Um, and that was a very important thing. Is the reason, going back to these 16-year-old girls, is the reason that the sexual heterosexual transmission was so high because the viral loads were through the roof? Because today, if... If if a person had if a male with HIV had mm -hmm. unprotected sex with a female, it would not be that high, would it? It wouldn't be that high. No. So the the one of the really important aspects of STDs is the high frequency of herpes and chancroid, mm -hmm. really open lesions that are very, very, if not, if not so it's treated. it's one-two punch. Yeah. Super high viral load. High and, viral load and, and transmissible. Opening. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So we knew all of that. Now, we also knew that some of these uh, were treatable, that um, both uh, medication, also um, Museveni, the, the still leader of Uganda, um, had this a very funny campaign called zero grazing. So they, they do a, raise a lot of cows and mm. this is very important in uh, Uganda is, is having a herd of cows. It means you're a, an important man, you know. <laughs> Museveni always wears this hat like he's raising cows. So zero grazing, the farmers and many people knew what that meant. One wife, one partner, you know, no grazing. Mm -hmm. And so there was a pretty good uh, public campaign. We did a lot of condom distribution. And so the government was receptive to this. Yeah. They understood oh, the they science. Knew. They understood the epidemiology. And they were completely on board with the campaign. They were very on board. They're, they also knew that this was going to be a geopolitical problem for them if, if people were dying in the prime of their lives at the rates they were. They, they got that. This, this was really clear to them. Can you estimate in a year how many people died from AIDS in Uganda when you were there? Oh, no, I can't estimate it. I'm but but I, I guess the point is, it's a staggering number. Yeah, and it's and and yet there were so few of you that were, that were on the front lines. If there's 16 million people, it, it wouldn't have surprised me if there were a million people who died. I mean, it's that kind of numbers. The um, I'm probably exaggerating, but not by much. Yeah. And and I think that the the sense of feeling overwhelmed um, is just really important. Um, what I realized I was doing, um, I don't know if you've interacted with people in the military um, much, but you know, they if they're on the battlefield, they triage. Mm -hmm. I triaged. The, the, I triaged in San Francisco. Um, if you didn't need chemotherapy, but you had Kaposi sarcoma, I didn't see you. Like I only saw what the, the sickest patients. Um, uh, the simple one was vincristine. Vincristine is actually re reasonably good against uh, KS. Um, I used it in Uganda a lot. It does cause some neuropathy, but um, if you if you're careful about how much, and then bleomycin. Again, you have to be careful because of the pulmonary toxicity. Yep. But old, good old fashioned uh, vincristine and bleo, and then um, Texel. Texel was approved. Uh, for Kaposi sarcoma um, after I left Uganda. It wasn't a drug um, before then. But yeah, no, I would 
I would see the patient and I would literally ask them and their family, can you walk? If you can walk- If yes, you're, you're too healthy for you're me. You're too healthy. We'll delay. There was oh, triage because wow. I only had on the shelf a certain amount of, of chemotherapy. How did you manage the personal toll of the, the grief and the death of, of seeing this? Because I, I mean, look, I think every doctor to some extent goes through this. Um, where you 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 try to sort of compartmentalize what you're seeing, um, but the truth of the matter is, virtually no doctor can really comprehend what you are describing yeah. there. And and how how did you process that? I have this philosophy, which I I don't recommend it for others. It's just my philosophy. I love um, people. I love interacting with people. I love getting to know the patients who I care for. And it makes me happy to think I'm helping. Helping might be helping them get better. Helping might be helping with their pain. Or they can talk about dying with me because it doesn't make me scared. Um, so I get a lot of joy in trying to contribute. Um, and even if I feel overwhelmed and if I step back and think, how can how can we cope with this? Um, my coping is more... Is leaning know, in. Yeah, yeah, just and, and does your husband share that? Do you do you I mean, do you, was there a yin and a yang to the relationship where you supported each other in a way that 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 was helpful in that? Because again, I yeah. I, I I do understand what you're saying, and I appreciate that there is uh, that there is an that there is a joy that comes from helping people. But I but I can I can also at least personally say that there are moments when it breaks down and you feel so overwhelmed by sadness. Yeah, no, I think the. Well, first of all, my, my husband is more introverted um, and probably gets more sad. Um, but we are also a good team because we are there for each other. And I think it's it's a special thing um, done in small amounts, not too much, to be able to come home and say, boy, that was tough. Yep. Here's what I dealt with today or can you I need to tell this story yep. or I want to talk about this um the other thing we did which is I think so important is because I, I I do drive a lot of joy in trying to help um but I'm not a martyr I don't believe in it you know like okay you worked hard I worked harder you suffered I suffered more I hate that <laughs> you know so we went we went to Greece we still laugh about going to Greece and eating our way through Greece for a week when we were in Uganda. And uh, we had a couple of other good trips. We went on a, a hilarious safari to a um, a place that <laughs> was Moya Lodge that had been closed to all tourists and was had just reopened. And uh, it was so great. We saw hippos and elephants. And we realized we were the only what you call in Uganda a mazungu, which is a white person there. <laughs> so it was it was a grand adventure. So we had some grand adventures and played tennis, enjoyed friends. So we we did um, as much to keep our spirits up as one can. 